Hello, my friends, and welcome back, and happy Wednesday to you. The back of the week has been broken, as we say here in Estonia. I'm, I'm sure everybody says that in all over the world. So half of the week is over, and you made it to the other half. But we begin with a little bit of a, I would want to say worrying news, but hey, don't worry about it. It's not, I'm sure it's nothing. <laughs> well, actually, it's something, because... Nuclear weapons have been deployed on Belarusian soil. This is what Alexander, Alexander Lukashenko, the dictator of Belarus, came yesterday out of, I don't know what cave he's in, he hasn't spoken for a long time. He came out of that cave and had that report to his generals and all of the public who was listening in fear. You could see it in the video. Well, about a year ago, Putin and Lukashenko both stated that uh, nuclear weapons will be deployed on Belarusian soil. Well, now it has happened. It officially has been reported that it's true. It doesn't really change much because Russia has intercontinental ballistic missiles, meaning that they can shoot nuclear weapons to any point on planet Earth anyway. So why stationing them on Belarusian soil changes anything? Well, it might only change if NATO would want to invade Belarus, Belarus, so that would be like invading a nuclear power suddenly. But Belarus is a Russian puppet anyway. So even if Belarus doesn't have nuclear weapons on their soil, and if you invade it, Russia still would react the same way. So it doesn't really change anything. That's why I said, don't worry about it. Uh, forget about it. What is much more worrisome, though, is the next thing we're going to talk about. It's not worrisome for Ukrainians, but it's very worrisome for uh, Russians because it's the Russian losses chart. I haven't included this for, what, six months already. Ever since the start of the Battle of Avdivka, I stopped reporting Russian losses. You know why? Not because they don't have huge losses, but because it doesn't give anything to anybody because Russians don't count their losses. They don't care. So it might give you a wrong idea when I say Russians have used huge losses because it gives an idea that it's harming them. While huge losses in reality, they're hindering Russian offensive capabilities, but they're not really harming Putin since he has a lot of manpower to take from. He doesn't care that there are thousand 130 KIAs in the Russian army per day, or KIAs and casualties combined, it doesn't matter which one is it. What this number says is that these people are taken out of the battle permanently. Their casualties, meaning killed in action or wounded in action, if they're wounded, they possibly won't go back to action because most of the Russian wounded die or are demaimed, demaimed, de uh, that word permanently. So, taken out of action. Huge number, and I will explain why also. Let's get to tanks, which is 13. That's a mediocre number. I mean, if you put 13 tanks in a row, it's, well, 13 tanks is a lot of tanks. But we're so used to seeing just the statistics that it doesn't really have an effect on us anymore. But the next number here is close to the absolute record of the entire war. 70 armored personnel vehicles. Now what's going on? 70, what the hell, per 24 hours? Well, because Russia was pushing from five directions, five different directions. They were heavily attacking because Russian army and Putin, of course, everybody now thinks that Ukraine... United States aid is not coming through and now is the time to push because Ukraine is at the weakest. Well, big mistake. Ukrainian defense is holding good, holding firm. It's steel wall. Avdivka is one point out of a thousand kilometer front line. It was 10 square kilometers. Yes, Ukrainians pulled out of Avdivka. They lost Avdivka. Russians occupied Avdivka. They will sell it as a victory and pro-Russian bloggers will sell it as a victory. But in my eyes, if you lose about 40,000 men and close to 1,000 armored personnel vehicles taking 10 square kilometers, it's not much of a victory, especially because after Avdivka, there are a lot of defensive lines that Ukraine has built out. The point is, Russia is now pushing in five directions to try to redo the Avdivka victory. It's, it's a pyrrhic victory in my eyes. Well, Krinki, the bridge that they're pushing, Avdivka, Kupiansk, Pahmut, and the Southern Front. <clears throat> they haven't broke Robotyne, for example. They haven't broken through anywhere, but they have lost a lot of armored vehicles, as we can see. Also, 53 artillery systems. Damn, they don't care at all. They don't. 
and I won't report these losses in every video because it gives, gives false idea because these numbers would be devastating for any NATO country and for Ukraine also, but it's Russia, they don't care, so it doesn't really change much. Also, what is huge is, here is vehicles and fuel tanks, 56 of them. All right, my friends, but I'll be moving on. I don't want to give you any uh, false sense of ideas here. We'll be going to Estonia, my home country, where I'm right now in Tallinn. These billboards were put up in Tallinn, and they are called an exhibition of Ruski Mir in Estonia, Russian world, a Russian miracle in Estonia. And they show, of course, the uh, very same area that they're put up, like this house here, the billboard shows the very same house, only destroyed by Russians, what we see in Avdivka and Mariupol. And these were put up all across Tallinn, my hometown right now where I am, but also in, in Lasname and Mustame, which are like uh, more Russian-speaking neighborhoods in Tallinn. Let's see another photo right here, boom. I've, I've, I've drive those streets, I know this place. <laughs> the thing is, these Russian-speaking neighborhoods, they will see now on these billboards what will happen if their mother country, mother Russia, will come to Estonia. It doesn't matter if they're pro-Russian, pro-Estonian. If Russia comes, whoever you are, whatever your ideology is, this is the outcome. Estonia will be destroyed. Every country that Russia goes over will be destroyed. Because Russians even destroy their own country. They don't care. It's just a different mindset. If you don't want that to happen, we can fight against it and we will. The thing is, a lot of people were like in Estonia uh, reacted to it. Oh, I don't want to see this in my city. I don't want what? I don't want to feel this fear. I don't want to get this depressive feeling when I see these billboards. Well, it's time to wake up. War is going on. We need to see it. We cannot put our heads under the sand like ostrich, whatever the bird is who goes under the sand to hide. We're, we have two options. We fight and prevent it, or we hide and mentally hide and don't want to see this stuff and just look away. And it's suddenly here, Ruski Mir is taking over. We have two options. If you choose that you don't want to see it, you don't want to be depressed, uh, you don't want to uh, feel bad, then Ruski Mir is soon at your door knocking, knocking down the door and doing, doing everything Stalin did, like deporting the families. The thing is, I don't want people to be depressed. This is why I report these news in a, like the most positive way I can. By not leaving out the negative, of course, I will not leave out the negative, but I don't, my goal is for you to get the information without feeling depressed after, because no, you, you cannot live if you're depressed. You cannot live in fear. You don't have to be afraid because I don't have to be afraid. I have a way to protect my country. Fear is if I feel I cannot do anything. If I can take a weapon and fight for my country, if I can do right now fighting the informational front for my country, which I'm doing, I don't have to be afraid because I know I can defeat the Russians and so can you, so can we all. They're nothing but a big bluff. So don't be afraid and start acting right now. My friends, another SU-34 was shot down today morning. Now, in the last three days, well, now it's four, yesterday it was three. In the last three days from yesterday to three days ago, it was six Russian planes, SU-35s and SU-34s. It's a huge loss. I knew why this is, because after Russians took up Divka and the presidential elections coming up in March, very soon, Putin wants more. They push in five directions. Ground invasion, like 70 APCs per day lost, and they are using even Air Force, which they don't really do because their losses, they immediately start losing the planes. So they don't care right now. Okay, send the planes also. And immediately we see the effect. They're losing the planes. And they're, some of them, irreplaceable. SU-35s, definitely irreplaceable. Well, in the last four days now, this is obvious, uh, four days, seven planes. Damn, that's a lot. Ukrainian Air Force Commander Mikola Olechuk says this, and I'll, I'll quote it. This time I can say that the Su-35 pilot was lucky. Well, the Su-34 was shot down, they fly in pairs. So the Su-35 ma maneuvered out of the way and is no longer taking any risks. And the Su-34 crew joined our Eternal Flight Brothers section. <laughs> well said. Yeah, so Russians today 
this is past 24 hours, but like what is happening today, we already get reports that Russians are pulling back and catching a breath because they have been pushing from five directions and losing seven planes. I mean, the commanders are worried. If you go to the Russian Telegram channel, uh, the soldiers on the front who report, um, <laughs> they don't want to push right now because they, they lost so many men in Avdivka and now they're pushing more. They lost so many armor personal carriers. Today, right now, they're standing by. No offensive operations in large scale right now going on because yesterday was insane for them. And also talking about insane, these losses don't even reflect in, in the 24 hour losses yet. We're going on to this is this section is titled and get your popcorn. This, this is crazy. Two Russian platoons lined up in, in an open field. There are photos and videos about it. You can find everything in the description below. And if you're watching from TV, then you can't go to the description. I'm sorry about that. But it, if you want to go to YouTube, you see every footage. I cannot show any of it. It's so bad. But I'm not kidding you. Two platoons. How much is it? Western platoons or Russian rota, whatever it is. Uh, confirmed, visually confirmed. I'll read you the report and then we'll talk about it. Because this is out of this world. Russian channels report that today a high march strike was carried out on a Russian military training ground of the 39th Separate Guards Motorized Rifle Brigade, located in occupied Trudivske, Donetsk region. Reportedly, 65 were killed and an unknown amount got wounded. Ukrainian forces managed to conduct a high Mars missile attack yesterday on Russian army assembly area near Volnovakha settlement. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, get through everything, but first I want to show you where Volnovakha is. This is the southern occupied Ukraine, this is the eastern, you know, Donetsk occupied. Volnovakha is right on the Suroviki line, as you can see, the black line right here. <laughs> so Russians might feel pretty safe there because it's Suroviki and, you know, Ukrainians were not able to penetrate it in the sovereign summer counteroffensive. And a Russian commander decided, okay, I want to make a speech to my whole road or company, line up two platoons or more, the whole company, line them up on an open field, I'm going to come and make a speech and they're all going to applaud and we're going to do a Ruski Mir thing. Now they lined up and they were visited by an uninvited missile from a HIMARS system. And this missile, these HIMARS missiles, they contain 180,000 small tungsten balls. And now imagine two full platoons of bad Russians standing on an open field, lined up like Dak Tochna commander waiting for the commander. Now they're visited by this one HIMARS missile. 180,000 tungsten balls go around like bing, 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 all across the air, making red mist out of everything that stands in their way. And the bad Russians are turned into good Russians, knocked out cold. And what's left of it is what you can see in the description below. I cannot show any of it, but it's all visual. Like it, it's not like shady photos. It's, it's actually just real clear photos. You can see it. Uh, watch at your own expense. Be viewer discretion is advised. I never say this, but I should. So yeah, these losses here in Volnovakha, they're not even the last in the last 24 hour losses chart. So they will be in there tomorrow. So expect huge manpower losses tomorrow. This is, I think this happened last time, like six months ago, something similar, a long time ago. My friends, Vali Slura, in, which in Estonia means foreign intelligence. So Estonian Foreign Intelligence Agency report their annual Estonian Foreign Intelligence Agency report. Now, Kaya Galla is Estonian Prime Minister and a badass of a woman who might be the next NATO General Secretary, we don't know, but that's a potential. She retweeted this stuff and I will now read you a chart that she retweeted about very commonly um, shared Russian propaganda lies and the opposite truth to them, what is actually truth, which is what Putin doesn't want people to see. Now this balances out, so if you want to be a part of the right side of history and work against Putin's narrative, then this chart is perfect because it pushes over everything that Russia builds, the sandcastle in the air or the chasing clouds or whatever, it, it, hard facts that push it over. Now the lie is Russia is a nuclear power and nuclear powers do not lose wars. Russia, of course, is a nuclear power. 
But the truth about it is, Russia uses threat of nuclear weapons to intimidate the West. Nuclear powers do lose wars. I don't want to remind this, I, I, I don't know if we can call a Vietnam War a losing for the United States, but definitely it wasn't a victory. The United States was a nuclear power, so it, it's not that black and white. So nuclear powers lose wars all the time in the recent 50 years that they have gone into wars. Lie from Putin. The war must be stopped to prevent escalation between Russia and NATO. And if anybody says right now that, oh, sending weapons equals more dead children, more dead women, let's think about peace. This is Putin's narrative because they're really running out of steam. Ukraine doesn't have any chance or any opportunity to even run out of steam because they will die. It's fight or die. So it's only Russia that can run out of steam. And it's only Russia who can search for peace because peace for Ukraine means another war in 10 years. For Ukraine's victory means only liberation of entire territory. So if you see anybody saying that extra weapons for Ukraine mean more dead children, more dead uh, women or people, then this is sharing Putin's narrative. The truth about it is a war with NATO can only be initiated by Russia itself, regardless of development in Ukraine. Russia's posture and actions unmistakably identify it as the aggressor. NATO is a defense alliance. Of course, if a person has beliefs in their head, I know this video is not going to change anything. So if you don't agree with me, I cannot do anything about it. Just put it in the comments. I'll be reading it and we'll go on with our lives. Lie. Western democracies cannot endure a drawn-out war of attrition and the mutual impact of sanctions. Well, my, well, this is even wrong from history. For World War I, the Western powers won. World War II, the Western powers won. Napoleonic Wars, the, the coalition that made sanctions against Napoleon, they won. And in the long term, the sanctions will hurt Russia also a lot. So the truth about this is the West did not seek either a short or long war, but due to Russian's actions, the West is receiving its, uh, reviving its defense industry with long-term consequences. Additionally, reducing dependence on Russian natural resources strengthens the West. So yeah, Putin really shot himself in the foot because he had West and the entire Europe on his palm. Germany was uh, feeding, like, you know, sucking the milk. <laughs> Sorry about this uh, reference. But now Germany is getting free from Russia. The whole Europe is getting free from Russia. Finland is in NATO. Sweden is going to join. And this is all Putin's work. So he shot himself in the foot. Next slide. The West must accept the military reality that Ukraine's territorial losses are inevitable. Truth. Ukraine's goal is to restore its territorial integrity and protect its sovereignty under Article 51 of the UN Charter. Lie. Ukraine must remain militarily and politically neutral. <laughs> Same as Finland after, after the Winter War and the Continuation War. You know, Simo Hauha going pew 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 500, knocked out cold. After all of that shenanigans, when Win uh, Finland had to cede 11% of the territory and they had a semi-deal with the Russians that they will be neutral, and Finland kind of held that deal because they never joined NATO and they were right next to Soviet Union buying gas and oil from them and getting some nuclear reactors from them. They still joined NATO right now. They dropped away the neutrality. And in truth, no Finnish people ever wanted to be neutral about Russians. I don't know how to say it in Finnish. If you're from Finland, uh, Russa, Russa, Russa. Yeah. The Finnish don't like Russians, they're not neutral about it. You know, Ukraine doesn't need to be also. They, they can be whatever they want to be, they're a free nation. The truth about it, from Russia's perspective, Ukrainian neutrality means substantive control over Ukrainian sovereign, sov, sovereignty, sovereignty. Effectively creating a puppet government. Which is true, yeah. Neutral Ukraine is Russia's Ukraine. Unfortunately, with Russia, it's very hard to stay neutral next to them. Lie. For European security, Ukraine should have a limited size of restricted weapon systems. Truth. Ukraine is becoming militarily one of the strongest countries in Europe and thus a, a cornerstone of European security architecture. And I do agree. When Ukraine wins and liberates all the territory, then Poland and Ukraine will be the most powerful countries in Europe, military-wise. Poland, of course, being the hub for NATO. 
there will be more NATO troops in Poland than in Germany in the end of this, I think. And Ukraine, of course, also. And I do agree with it. Every military in the world will learn from the Ukrainians after this, because this kind of war is not according to NATO doctrine. And NATO doctrine is not prepared for this kind of war. This is what the Ukrainian soldiers every time tell me when I talk to them in Kiev, that they get their training in Great Britain. And thank you, UK, for this, of course. But the training does not prepare them at all for what is laying in Avdivka or Bakhmut because their doctrine is outdated. The warfare has changed so much in Ukraine that no doctrine in the world has yet adapted to it. And Ukrainians are creating that doctrine now and they will be teaching it to everybody. Lie. A functional European security order must consider Russian interests. Ha 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 ha. Truth about this. Paying need to Russian interest would jeopardize the security of European countries by reducing the present presence of allies on NATO's eastern flank. Uh, the thing is, democratic Europe is a ball game of free nations who vote for what direction they want to go in. Ukraine voted in 2014. The people voted not in a voting ballot, but in Maidan where the Russian and Ukrainian special forces controlled by Russia shot over 100 people just on the streets. So Ukrainian people have voted, they have shown their democratic power and chose the West. It was the Maidan revolution where European Union flags were waving, they wanted to be in. And you, didn't, you don't buy this stuff, this is, came from the people inside, it's a motivation you cannot buy. Now my friends will jump for 15 seconds on the Joe Biden. If you like him or if you don't like him, unfortunately or fortunately, I cannot play this game alone because for me it's not conservative or liberal, it's not Democrat or Republican. For me, it's my country, it's my freedom, it's my family, it's Ukraine and Estonia, the free nation. So for me, it doesn't matter who leads, what party is it, I will fight for what I think is right, which is the freedom of my people and Ukrainian people. So. I cannot take part in this. I like Joe Biden or I don't like Joe Biden. I'm, I'm sorry. I like you anyway. If you're watching this video, you're fine by me. What I came to tell you was, I told you we'd be announcing sanctions on Russia. We'll have a major package announced on Friday. I'll be happy to sit with you all while doing that, okay? Now, what this is all about is that little known fact that uh, Navalny died. They didn't die, but he was, he was killed by Putin. He was... I cannot even say these words because YouTube, but uh, Putin knocked out cold Navalny. Now, Biden said a few years ago that Putin does anything to Navalny, then the United States will react strongly. So we're now expecting strong, strong reactions. And uh, on Friday, this reaction is going to be seen and publicized by Biden. Now, if people are saying this as a weakness that, oh, why don't we invade Moscow? These sanctions are for weak people then unfortunately I have to disagree with you. Sanctions are an impossibly strong weapon. They're the strongest weapon in the globalized connected world that there is. Connections, globalization and trade, free trade is what lifts the countries up. This is the foundation of wealth and the well-being of people in any country. If you cut this off, nothing will happen for the first five years, maybe even 10, but after that, the co coming out from that hole, almost impossible. Of course, if you don't agree with me, put it in the comments. I'll read it respectfully. Now, what are secondary sanctions? And these are how Russia has been able to still import stuff from the West. Secondary sanctions are designed to prevent third parties from trading with countries subject to sanctions issued by another country. So, like Kazakhstan, <laughs> it's it's weird coincidence that after European Union did like five rounds of sanctions, Germany's export to Kazakhstan rose, what, 10,000% or 1,000%, something like that. Coincidence? Maybe they like Mercedes so much in Kazakhstan? No, because it was uh, Kazakhstan who was selling this stuff to Russia. So, oh, Kyrgyzstan, was it Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan, something like that. Thing is, we need secondary sanctions for these countries. Now, my friend, a little shenanigans from the Russian leadership for you. Shoigu officially reported to Putin that the Krinky bridgehead, uh, the bridgehead across the Dnipro River, the 500 Ukrainian troops, or as I call them, the 300 Ukrainian Spartans, uh, has been captured. Minister of Defense of Russia 
reported that. Now, Russian soldiers, of course, know this isn't true, because if you're watching, you're standing like 200 meters from the Ukrainian bridgehead and you see the Ukrainian guy there waving to you, you know it's not true. I know it's not true, because let's go there. Well, I talked to the guys in the bridgehead, actually. That's why I know it's not true. Uh, but this bridgehead right here, not a big thing. Uh, in a way that the area they control is very small. It's not about the area, it's about tying up all of these Russian... Uh, uh, an entire army almost has been tied up, infantry army, has been tied up to just push out this bridgehead. They've not been able to do it. Nothing can do it, apparently, because they tried everything. Why is it so important is that if Shoigu, the leader of the Russian armed forces, reports that to Putin, the dictator, then the soldiers and the commanders on the field who actually see their men die every day for this bridgehead of Krinki, see that Shoigu doesn't care at all. It doesn't really just blatant lie to Putin to endorse him for president or the elections are coming up, they need victory. So uh, we took up Divka, we took Krinki bridgehead. Well, uh, this is sowing very big tensions in the Russian army, because the Russian army itself, as a unit, knows that bridgeheads still exist, they are losing troops there every day. But Shoigu is <laughs> reporting that to Putin. So we'll see what comes out of it, but uh, a lot of complaining videos might come in the future about this. My friends, August Mission is a pro-Ukrainian organization that is helping Ukraine, a charity organization led by Bruce and Jarvis in Utah and I had a great time with them and they gave me their network and connected me to a lot of people. So I want to thank them. We actually, after a very long day, we went to a bar and I gifted them Martyrs Army flag and you can see it all on the, on the screen right now. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Jarvis, for giving us, the whole team, such great connections and driving us around and showing us everything beautiful that there is in Utah. Thank you, August Mission. Also, we were driven around by Troy, a member of Arthur's army in Utah, and Troy was exceptionally nice to us and uh, actually part of a log logistics group, so perhaps, maybe, we're going to do a pro-Ukraine mission together. Troy also helped us out a lot in Utah, so thank you. You also got uh, Arthur's army flag, so I, I hope to see it up on your wall somewhere, Troy. Thank you for doing what you did for us. All right, my friends. Thank you so much for coming back. I do value you a lot. And until my next video, which is tomorrow, so be sure to be back. Also, push, push the bell notification, please, because I just watched <laughs> 10 years I've been on YouTube, and only now I watch the video of how it works. Uh, if you subscribe, you don't see my videos. If you push the bell notification, then you see my videos on your homepage. So uh, subscribe, and then the bell is like somewhere next to it, like a bell note. I can, you have to push that also, then you can see it. I didn't know, now I do. Until my next video, my friends, Slavo Ukraini, and bye bye.